everyone. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Amy Starczewski, and I'm the Associate Director of the Master's Program in Oral History here. Uh, this event is part of our ongoing workshop series, which goes through the academic year, and today's our last one. And Jennifer wanted to go last. <laughs> um, and we bring together people who are working in the field of oral history and at the edges of other fields that overlap with oral history and uh, really try to showcase some of the most uh, cutting edge work that's happening. And so we're really thrilled to have Jennifer here today. This talk has been generously co-sponsored by the Institute for Research in African American Studies and the MA program in Museum Anthropology here. Uh, and it's part of the Paul F. Lazarus Held Lecture Series. Um, so I want to just, before we start, highlight that we've got two events coming up uh, next week that some of you might be interested in, and I'll pass around um, flyers for both of them. Uh, we have a two-day conference, Oral History in Our Times, and that's going to highlight work of the Center for Oral History on uh, detention and rendition in Guantanamo, um, a little bit stuck in there on Thursday morning on jazz oral history, which should be really fantastic. Um, and then this, the afternoon on Thursday is going to be a celebration and reflection uh, for the fifth anniversary of our Oral History Master of Arts program. Um, so the culmination of that will be a showcase, a multimedia oral history showcase of student work from the students in the current cohort um, with the wine and cheese and also a champagne and cake reception. So um, you're all very welcome to attend. Um, so let me just introduce Jennifer, and then I'll turn it over to, to you. Uh, Jennifer is an anthropologist, public historian, and curator. She serves as the vice director and director of research at Riesel Heritage Center. And she spearheads their oral history project, and conducting oral history workshops, and served on oral history advisory boards, including StoryCorps Brio. Before she worked at Weeksville, she worked with City Lawyers Place Matters Project on the Lower East Side of Manhattan to document place-based stories and develop new place-making strategies and approaches. She teaches courses right now in cultural anthropology, ethnology, material culture, world heritage, and museum studies at the new school. She's teaching two of those this semester, so I know it's been a busy time. Uh, Parsons and Pratt Institute and is a contributor to a number of publications, including most recently the Radical Museum of Democracy, Dialogue, and Debate. And Jennifer holds degrees from Stanford University, the University of California, Los Angeles, and the University of Michigan. So welcome. Thank you very much for Thank coming you. to share your work with us. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to Amy and Harry Marshall Clark and the, the master's students who just had a great conversation with, um, for this opportunity to talk about Weeksville and what we're doing there. Um, what, what I wanted to do today is just kind of give you an overview of how, you know, who we are at Weeksville, although some of you are now going to start. Um, and also um, our, an overview of our project, and then, and, and then a specific direction towards activism um, that is sort of happening organically. So it's not, it's sort of, a, some of this is kind of a thinking aloud where uh, it could be seen as more preliminary research, but um, um, I'm interested in getting your feedback and sort of seeing what you guys think about the possibilities and, and, and maybe in the Q&A discussions we can talk about um, um, different experiences that you've had in your world to work in approaching these kinds of topics. Um, so, um, Weeksville Heritage Center uh, represents a history that had been um, completely erased and through a community struggle was uh, fought for and reclaimed in the 1960s. Um, oral history, as you all know, I'm sure, um, lends really nicely to actually trying to fill, you know, what people perceive as gaps. And also what we've been learning over the years is that there's a lot of distortions as well. So it also helps to kind of show nuances that will correct and, and those distortions and confront distortions a little bit. Um, so we, the way that we design our oral history project, feel free to come on in. Yeah, let me see. We just started, so. So we, we figured out a way to approach our oral history project, and then what happens, is, um, which often happens, is that certain themes come up that just sort of organically that can recognize as patterns, um, certain angles. And we have a few of those that have been happening once we've been talking to people over the years. One of those is activism. Um, so I'm going to give you, I'm not going to give you a comprehensive um, uh, list uh, or view of all those participants, but I am going to give you a glimpse of, of how that's happening. Um, and 
what's been really important, I think, in that regard is it's showing us an answer to a question that we get asked a lot because Weeksville is, um, in many people's eyes, a success story in terms of uh, you know, the 1960s being able to fight for history. And as you know, in New York, we don't always have victories with preservation and with, with um, having um, different voices represented. So we, we often get asked, you know, how Weeksville came to be, how it emerged, how is this possible? And so we want to we want to think of more about that to be able to present to people that the the contemporary possibilities of today, um, what you could possibly do um, um, wherever you are in terms of being a catalyst for change. Um, and what we've been seeing is that these things didn't happen in isolation. It was part of the climate at the time. Um, a lot of people came to Weeksville, were part of different movements that brought them to Weeksville. And also, um, Weeksville um, and, and their efforts at Weeksville were really an extension of their activism uh, across the board. So this is Weeksville. Um, I asked this earlier, but how many of you have been here? Great. All the, all the Weeksville staff. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Um, we consist of three historic houses. They date uh, approximately from the 1840s to the 1880s. Uh, we've restored the, the interiors to three different time periods, the 1860s, the 1900s, and the 1930s. This is what we're using temporarily as our offices. What you cannot see in this um, image is that we are almost a full city block um, green space, um, right now construction site of a $40 million building that's almost finished. Um, and, and the green space will be uh, landscaped to, these, to 19th century agricultural features to harken back to the time of the original Weeksville residents. Um, this is our mission. Um, we are aiming to document, preserve, and interpret the history of people of African descent um, in Brooklyn, in Weeksville, and beyond. And um, everything that we do is rooted in the history. Um, we're very adamant about that, but also everything has a contemporary connection. And this is also where oral history can be really helpful because it lets us know how people are seeing the past, what the past means to them, how they can connect the present to the past. And people do that in all sorts of different ways. Um, so we still, uh, through historic research tours programs at, at the museum, we interpret what we call Forgotten History of Weeksville, a free black intentional land owning community which established its own schools, churches, anti-slavery organizations, and operated as a safe space for people of African descent in the greater New York area throughout the 19th century. Um, and this is a history that, like I said earlier, nobody knew about, the people who did knew very little, so it's a very important history. I'm not gonna talk too much about that 19th century history today, but I encourage you to take the tour, come to visit Weeksville, go to the houses, and you'll get the full story from our great educators. Um, I also want to mention that um, we're kind of, we kind of tell the story of two histories. So there's a 19th century history, and then equally important is the 1960s, uh, late 1960s, 1970s rediscovery story of that history. And that's mostly what I'm going to focus on today. Um, we use, I mean, some people might see this as a cliche now, um, Dolores Hayden's book, uh, The Power of Place. We use the power of place to trigger memories. And, and basically, people see the tangible culture, they see the architecture, and they remember what they used to do in the neighborhood, how they used to interact, what used to be here. And so we use the, the, the we're very lucky in that sense, but we use this tangible culture basically to um, produce these memories. Um, just to locate <laughs> us, um, Wicksville is located in um, what's called Central Brooklyn. Oh, anyway, I had a graphic oh, to show you, but anyway, <laughs> this there was a, a little circle to show you. So here's Wicksville. Um, we are in Crown Heights, technically. It used to be Bed Stuy. Um, Bed Stuy and Crown Heights are our closest neighborhoods. Um, Okay. 
There we go. <laughs> One of the interesting things that's been happening is we still disappear from the maps altogether at a certain point. And now we're starting to see that we're back on the maps. So we like to think that these memories that people have been feeling in relation to, to the center and the effort has, have actually been recreating the place, literally, and putting the place on the map. Okay, so this is classic central Brooklyn. Um, you have, you know, these beautiful brownstones intact, um, abundance of churches, very close-knit neighborhoods, predominantly African-American, Caribbean, African immigrant residents alongside a sizable Hasidic Jewish community. And after World War II, you had a lot of people of um, African descent coming from the southern part of the U.S., um, as well as the Caribbean, and our, our oral histories represents that diversity. Um, you, this is actually um, Kingsborough houses right across the street. Um, so, so Brooklyn is known for these rich multicultural and physical resources, but at the same time, the area is also known for, and this is not for no reason, without reason, um, a number of challenges. High crime, insufficient infrastructure, racial tension, poverty, inaccessibility, as some of you were mentioning earlier, ethnic conflict, um, and also just a really um, disparaging reputation. And it's actually only recently that Brooklyn has become the hot place to be and to live, um, which is consistent with this tremendous wave of gentrification that's happening right now, that's um, pricing out people, that is, um, that, that is um, I think it's like around nine billion dollars that are being invested in, in Brooklyn, and I forget how many, 40,000 res residents in a very short time span. And I'm sure those of you who are familiar with Brooklyn have seen a lot of that. So um, it's very much on our minds. It's very much on people's minds, these changes. And, um, and I'm just saying all this so you know the context in which we're producing these oral histories. Um, but people are very concerned about being displaced, of course, and also the character of the neighborhood changing. Um, not just physically, but also population-wise. And so oral history, again, is very key in tapping into people's memories because it's one of the most useful ways to make the invisible visible in that sense. Whether people are able to stay or not, I mean, we want people to be able to stay and not feel forced out. But the, the Weeksville itself, the 19th century um, history, was completely forgotten. And in many ways, we know that the history is sort of being erased in front of our eyes. So that's one of those things where we're trying to pay attention and be attentive about um, how we approach it. I see. Yeah. Okay, so um, the 1968 history, this is a big year. Um, just, you all probably know New York history very well, but after the 1950s, after World War II, um, the city, like many cities, <coughs> began to experience white flight, what's called white flight to the suburbs. Um, a decline in business and traditional industries which were moving outside of New York to places like New Jersey, Long Island, where there's more space. So naturally, this left a void in working class areas. There was an increase in crime, and that accompanied with the fiscal crisis in the 1970s where the city almost declared bankruptcy, um, was the state of affairs. So um, alongside all of this, um, there was a building boom happening post-1950, but at the same time, um, lots of buildings were being torn down to make way for new developments. Um, so this is definitely the case in, in Bedford, Stuyvesant, and Crown Heights area to a certain degree where Wigsville is. Um, so New York in the 1960s was experiencing this gradual economic and social decay. Um, a series of labor strikes, transit and teachers, um, including the famous Ocean hill Brownsville strike, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, and also 1968, you know, um, very big year because uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April, Kennedy is assassinated three years before Malcolm X is assassinated in New York. Um, you have the, the Housing Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1968 signed as well. So, you know, there's a lot going on. This is a very charged time, and I just say all these things as reminders because this is when Weeksville's history was rediscovered. So it'll make sense, the kind of stories that have come up in interviews that weren't about necessarily um, civil rights and activism. But there's so many connections that, that ground um, uh, the, the, uh, what happened with Luke's film. Okay. 
So the Hunter Ply Roadhouses were rediscovered in 1968, um, although Jim Hurley, who's here to the right, um, tells us it, 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 technically it's a few years before because he was already doing research on it. Um, he was a volunteer college instructor at Pratt Institute, and there were a handful of students uh, like Del Dolores McCullough here on the left, um, who were part of something called Essential Neighborhood College Study Course that was working on a neighborhood survey project and looking into these historic communities with, which they knew little about. One of the ways that they did this is they walked around the neighborhood and they just looked at it. We actually are scanning a lot of slides right now that show uh, people, uh, show you know, Dolores and Jim and Pat Johnson and others who were involved walking around the neighborhood and looking at things in, under, in, uh, in disrepair. Um, so they, they were figuring out the boundaries of the area generally, and then they were looking for architectural evidence. So one of the ways that they did this is that um, Joe Haynes, who's here, uh, was an engineer for MTA, and then he also had a pilot's license. So he, they rented a plane, a prop plane from Peterborough Airport, and they flew over the area actually looking for um, architectural evidence of historic Weeksville. And this is similar we, to what they saw. We, we actually now have aerial views that we, from them taking pictures in the plane. Um, this is actually probably from the top of the Senior Center, which was the tall building of Kingsboro I showed you. Um, so this is what they saw. These three houses, which are now the Hunterfly Road houses, are perpendicular to this main road. And that's usually a sign that it predates the modern 19th century Grid Street system. And indeed it did. Um, as it turns out, it was a portion of a distinct <coughs> colonial, Dutch colonial road. So this is sort of a, a road, uh, how people are guessing, the road went through out Kings County before you had the grid system applied to, to this area in New Brooklyn. Um, and before that, it was a Native American trade path. Um, so, you know, people were very excited about this discovery. Not too long after the discovery, they learned that they were going to be torn down, of course, through an urban renewal um, project called Model Cities. Um, and not these houses first. First, it was a block of houses that were a couple streets away um, from the Hunterfly Road houses. And Jim Hurley, when we've done his oral history, tells the story literally. He saw the headlines one night. He, he immediately wrote a telegram, which we now have a copy of the telegram. He sent a telegram for. <laughs> For, for people who've never seen a telegram, um, it looks very retro at this point with social media queries. But um, he basically insisted that they stop the demolition and that they um, at least in, in allow an investigation of the site, the history. And you can imagine in this very charged time, people finally learn of this history. They finally go to the area. They're, they're, they think they know where it is, and they finally have the chance to learn about it. And it, all the physical evidence is going to be torn down. So, um, um, and they were going to make a way for, the, for a new housing project, which is now called Wicksville Gardens. Um, so they were not able to halt the demolition. They all pulled strings and did whatever they could. They were not able to halt it, but they were allowed to do an archeological excavation of those houses. Um, so these are images from 1968, and this shows you the, the intergenerational participation. You had kids, you had Boy Scouts, you had school children from across the street from PS243 who we still work with. Um, you had uh, um, scholars, you had everyday residents, you had activists, you had people who became activists through this effort. Um, so it was a very broad spectrum of people who got involved. And, and just so you put this in a little bit in perspective, um, do you all know about the African Burial Ground? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I never know. I ask my classes sometimes they never heard of it. Um, this, this is, um, uh, so you know that there was the controversy that happened with that. It was like a 10 year community struggle to um, save and defend that history and stop that, that construction. So this archaeological excavation is 23 years before that which is incredibly pioneering. I mean, we're talking about extremely elite disciplines, preservation, archaeology, um, very elite disciplines that you don't usually see um, disenfranchised communities participating in. And you had people full force participating, figuring it out, learning it, um, and making it happen. And this is the, the passion and the love of commitment at the time. So we have all these great photos, color in black and white, 
of um, people who were involved in this effort. Um, the school children were essential. Um, there's a young Jim Hurley in the background there. <laughs> Um, and this is PS243, which became the Weeksville School. This was uncovered in um, uh, 19, I mean, not uncovered. It was, um, the name was changed in 1978. Um, and uh, uh, it's actually a direct descendant of Colored School Number 2, which was the second African free school when um, uh, um, people of African descent were excluded from education and, and school was segregated. Um, and that school was located in Weeksville. So it's a, it's a very important historical institution as well, and one that, that um, Weeksville Heritage Center continually works with to through all of our programming. Um, so the school was very involved in the archaeological digs. They had a mini museum as well. Um, this is Dr. Evelyn Castro, who was a teacher at the time. And I, I, I want to play a clip because I think that her part of her oral history represents um, understanding a little bit about ha how activism works and the kind of forms of acti uh, that activism takes. And um, I was at a, a, a conference, I don't know if you all attended, I, I think I saw Amy there actually, last fall with Luisa Passerini, um, Art uh, Memory and Historical Consciousness. Yeah, I was, I was oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, and she said something that really resonated with me, was, which was that um, oral history, the critical work of oral history is to erode illusions. And I think that, especially for disenfranchised communities, it's really important to confront the stereotypes as much as possible. And so the clip that I'm going to play is from Evelyn Castro talking about um, what this excavation, what this rediscovery meant to people in terms of confronting stereotypes. And I think it's critical. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, it definitely a kind of act. Morgan University, mm -hmm. and, and going away morning, I remember I used to get the New York Times delivered, and I remember in the dormitory, I was reading an article on the front page of the Times, and it said, Bedford Stuyvesant, get up, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. So I, I called home, and I said, Ma, we live in a ghetto? Mm -hmm. what, you know, what does that mean? Because I'd always lived in a house in a brownstone. Mm -hmm. My mother didn't work, my father did. Mm -hmm. um, all my sisters and brothers had gone to school. My parents both had were, uh, either went to, my mother actually married my father after three years of college, so they went to college. I had piano lessons, Girl Scouts. I, I had no idea that people from the outside considered where we lived and who we were as part of the ghetto. What did she say to you when you asked her about it? She said that that's not really the case, that we are a community. And we have a lot of things that we are doing uh, to support our children and our seniors, and that th that racism exists, and people will look at us in a certain way, but we know who we are. Mm -hmm. And I found that when I I wanted to teach in Bed Stuy, and that's how I picked the Isaac Newton School, which became the Weeksville School. Mm -hmm. And I found that the same stereotypes existed of what people thought about the kids and who they were. Mm -hmm. And um, not to say that we didn't have kids who were struggling economically, uh, but uh, their standards and who they were. So I found that the Weeksville digs and the things that we were doing to go across the street to the vacant lot and dig up things, pieces of china, pieces of glass, and to tell the story of Weeksville, especially for young children who did many tactile things, making butter, mm. uh, quilting, mm. uh, uh, candle making, it helped them to connect to their past. My grandmother. Um, so, the, so the important thing for, for me is that um, um, Evelyn Castro, like a lot of other people we interviewed, directly connect the getting involved with Weeksville um, as a kind of activism that changes stereotypes, that corrects these distortions of perceptions. We find that that's coming up a lot in our, inter in our interviews. Um, so, people took the evidence that they were getting, the archaeological evidence that they were getting from the um, excavation, and they brought them to use to actually save the Hunterfly Roadhouses, which were also threatened by demolition. Um, but this time, you know the, the end of that, we actually win. Um, <laughs> um, so these, this is, you know, before Twitter, and, 
Facebook where people were putting a call out for people to come and testify. And this is sort of, you know, I consider this as part of the oral tradition that we're talking about as well with oral histories are a part of. Um, getting people to come and testify about this history. We know so much more about this history than they knew at the time, and they were still going out to the, to the right as an image of the Boy Scouts with a bag of artifacts waiting to testify. We've been looking for that testimony. We've gone everywhere. We can't seem to locate it, um, but we, we haven't given up hope. Um, people say without the children, without the kids, which so wouldn't have um, happened. Um, because of their testimony, we uh, were made a New York City landmark in 1971 and then also protected on the National Register for Historic Places. So the houses um, stayed standing and, um, and uh, you know, the next step was sort of repairing and uh, making sure that continued. Um, so there was, after um, all these different stages of trying to secure this history, reclaim it, um, one of the things that people did was um, try to collect stories. So the first oral history effort actually began in collaboration with Maker Evers, and we're, we're trying to reconstruct as much of what, how this process was approached as, as possible. We're actually rediscovering our own archives and trying to figure out what happened. Um, but there were about, at least as far as we can see, about 25 or 30 interviews done with longtime residents like Harriet and Lane here to the, the right, and this is a picture of her when she's older, um, trying to get their memories down and documented right away. And I won't go into details, but when, when those audio cassettes were rediscovered, just think shoebox smashed, <laughs> etc. Um, most of them survived, and I'm happy to say today we actually have um, all of them that have survived are digitized and transcribed. So they're preserved, um, and we made that a priority um, around 2003 or so. So Harriet Elaine is, is an interesting um, uh, oral history because we don't have an audio recording of her, and we have these handful of handwritten memories as well. Um, her family, once she died, also donated things that are part of the family, like uh, her wedding dress and her beaded purses and the family Bible. So we have we have all these sort of personal items um, associated with this this history. Before she died, she lived almost to be a hundred. At ninety seven, she died. Um, she wrote at the age of eighty nine a six page essay called "This Is What I Know About Weeksville," where she talks about everything she knows in six pages, and um, a lot of them are institutions that are part of Weeksville history and how she associated. It with them, what she was part of, church groups. Um, she talks a lot about the schools. This is Colored School Number Two, and also um, a derivation of Colored School Number Two, PS83, that is now PS243. Um, so we have a handful of these actual autobiographical letters. Um, Megan, our research <coughs> is here today, and I think we have less than 10, but I think we're, we, we keep stumbling across them, so we're sort of considering that as a, uh, also a part of this effort. Okay, so um, what uh, we've been doing is restarting the oral history project. Um, and we're trying to figure out the best way to do that, considering these two histories, the 19th century history and 1960s. We're not willing to give either up. And so what we've done is um, uh, basically target four groups. The founders who were involved in the, the early excavations, the rediscovery, the, the preservation efforts, et cetera, um, people who actually lived in the specific historic houses, they could be descendants of people who lived there in the 19th century, or they could live them there themselves. We, we have been trying to track people down, people kind of show up at the door, um, and we try to record that. Um, Relative to historic figures, there's a number of people in Weeksville that were on the national scene, like anti-slavery, there were journalists, there were um, uh, pastors, um, et cetera. Um, and so some of their descendants are around and we are, we're trying to interview them. So these are the more traditional ways of approaching oral history for sure. 
And then our biggest category, which you know, we're still thinking through, is long time for plume residents. And, and the idea is we just don't know what's out there. We don't know what kind of stories are out there to tell, so we don't really want to limit it fully, but we sort of have to prioritize and, and figure out how to approach it. Okay. So I, I, that's sort of the overview of our project. Um, to date, we have about 130 oral histories collected, and um, we have them, most of them are almost all of them transcribed and digitized, and we're trying to stick with that because we want to make them accessible in our new center. Um, so this, this, um, so <coughs> this, one of the themes that has been coming up, as I mentioned earlier, is that the people who have come to Weeksville, especially in this founder category, but not exclusively, um, people might have just lived in the neighborhood, were very steeped in a lot of different activist activities. And so the, the next segment of the presentation is just to show you a glimpse of those things coming up. Um, so this, again, is um, Jim Hurley and Dolores McCullough. We've interviewed them several times, you remember them, and that's them in front of the houses. Um, I'm going to play a clip. One of the, the things that comes up a lot is just how um, everyday people were involved in the struggle, and sort of breaking down this definition of what it means to be a community struggle, and how um, they were able to be resourceful and do what they needed to do, um, whatever it took. So I'm just going to play that quickly. And you'll hear um, Dolores McCullough's voice. However, we also have to realize that this was a community effort. The people who actually started Weekster, we were all just community people. We didn't have any PhDs. They didn't come until later on, OK? Uh, there were people that I worked in the courthouse. I was a court reporter in downtown Brooklyn in civil and Supreme Court. And I knew a lot of people downtown. So we were able to get things done just by clerks who knew where to find things. Uh, there was a man, Wilson Williams, who was a Boy Scout leader here in Brooklyn. Wilson now is an elderly gentleman, and he's lost both of his legs. Uh, and his Boy Scouts, we had an archaeological dig, digging up stuff in the beginning from these same houses in this area. So what, what I'm, I like these, this clip. It represents a number of um, segments and different oral histories that we've been collecting where people are actually demystifying the organizing process a little bit and showing how you can do what you can do where you are. And I, I think that's a, a very um, a strong benefit of oral history work, to hear how it was done so that you can see that it's doable. Okay, so um, Joan Maynard, as some of you may know, um, was our matron for about 30 years she is an artist and illustrator. She led the effort to um, save the houses and to keep them standing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know that many people know how she even got involved. Um, I think she's a great example of someone who wasn't necessarily, did, didn't necessarily start out as an activist, but became an activist for 30 years and basically committed her life to Weeksville and preserving this history. She was very, very um, uh, into the children, uh, learning their history, owning their history, participating in their own history, claiming it, um, you know, fighting for trails, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so how did she, she become involved? She was connected to many other uh, cultural and arts organizations that were also very politically minded. And another person that we interviewed, Esther Cooper Jackson, which you might know of, um, talks about her relationship with Joan. Um, Esther Cooper Jackson moved to New York in the 1950s from Virginia. She was raised in segregated schools. Before she came to New York, she worked with the Southern Negro Youth Congress in Virginia, and then in Birmingham, Alabama, to organize black women tobacco workers and steel workers. She was involved with countless labor demonstrations. And by the 1940s, she completed a master's thesis eventually on domestic workers. She, wanted, she said she wanted to go on her PhD, but she got distracted by activism. <laughs> um, in college, she helped with coal organizing drives and spent a summer working on a voting campaign. Um, 
When she moved to New York, she founded Freedom Ways with W.B. Du Bois um, in 1961. And this is a journal that's noted as the central theoretical journal of the 20th century black arts and intellectual movement in the United States. Um, Freedom Ways covered local, national, and international political and libera liberation movements of the day and lasted for 25 years. And if you look closely, can you see who the illustrator is? <coughs> it's Joan Maynard. <laughs> Joan Maynard was an illustrator for a number of the Freedom Wave um, journals, which was a very important um, arts and cultural journal. Um, so uh, Esther Cooper Jackson talks about those connections, and I just want to play a couple of clips where she talks about um, supporting artists and how they were part of these organizations, artists like Joan, but then also how she met Joan. Uh, and we felt it was important uh, that we involve the, uh, the, the artists, the, the writers, the poets, uh, along with the historians and the civil rights activists. And this is what we wanted. This was in our first editorial, mm -hmm. from the first issue. We made very clear that was what we wanted to do. Uh, United Front to fight for these uh, important uh, issues in black America. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how did um, Joan become involved with the journal? Uh, well, I think she started, like many of the artists of the period, started coming around uh, to, uh, I, I don't recall whether she was at the first event, but coming around to some of the events. We'd have debates, we would have uh, poetry readings. Mm -hmm. We would, uh, uh, if, a, if a play often opened on Broadway that we thought was important, we'd buy up the theater for two nights and then, then we help raise money for the magazine at the same time. That's amazing. But <coughs> and uh, uh, I guess she was just a warm, wonderful human being. She used to, when I didn't get to tell that sometimes I get a packet of material mm -hmm. that she sent me from things she was doing because I was busy doing other things. Mm -hmm. And I considered her really a, a, a personal friend even though we weren't, uh, you know, I, sometimes weeks would go by and so forth and maybe several months that I didn't see her. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, I, and she was deeply involved with Freedom Ways. So people who, who know Joan Maynard know her as this exceptional person, and they don't know the context that created her, produced her. Um, and she was an exceptional person, for sure. Um, but it doesn't mean that there can't be other exceptional people. So one of the benefits of oral history is showing how people created these, these networks and these webs, these, these political, intellectual, and cultural webs that would support one another and provide momentum in, into doing something like um, uh, rediscovering and creating a week's film. It becomes part of their activism. So we, we want, again, we want to encourage people that it's possible to be a Joan Maynard. You know, you can start off, she has a beginning, uh, like a lot of us do, and a formation. And so, you know, again, they, they really help to mystify that process, I think. And you can see that there's all sorts of ways to get there. Um, Elsie Richardson was, is, is another person you might know heard uh, or heard about. She was a, a community activist who was very much involved in support of Weeksville. Um, uh, she passed away fairly recently, unfortunately. She was the leader and the co-founder of something called the CBCC, um, which started in 1952, the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Committee, a coalition of over 90 community organizations working to improve Black Brooklyn's socioeconomic conditions during a time that was rampant with social ills. Um, according to uh, historian Brian Purnell, um, these social ills are identified as cramped housing stock, insufficient health services, inadequate youth programming, over overcrowded schools, and infrequent sanitation services. <coughs> uh, the CBCC eventually led to the creation of the Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation, the first federally and privately funded community development corporation in the country, begun then by Robert F. Kennedy. Um, and intended to be a model for combating urban poverty. Elsie led a very publicized walk through the neighborhood with Kennedy to evaluate the neighborhood conditions. And there's been a lot written about this. Um, 
Elsie was one of the founders, we consider one of the founders of the original Weeksville Society. She helped to facilitate the original excavation that revealed Weeksville artifacts um, discovered during the demolition process that I mentioned. And she was also critical in helping with Weeksville purchase the historic houses through the assistance of Bed Stuy Restoration Corporation. So again, you see all these connections. These things are not, Weeksville is not happening in isolation. It's happening in, you know, what, what one person has told me that I interviewed. It was in the air. <laughs> Activism was in the air. She said, if you weren't involved, something was wrong with you. <laughs> Actually, this is the person who said that. <laughs> this is um, Betty Welch. Um, this is her daughter, Sharon Welch, who is, um, that's a picture of her that's become sort of famous at Weeksville. She's holding one of the coins found at the archaeological excavation. Um, Betty Welch came to Weeksville through what she calls education activism. So um, her daughter uh, was a student at PS243 involved in the archaeological excavation um, and um, actually is now a teacher in Maryland and attributes her, uh, her commitment to education from this whole experience. And that's, we also get a lot of that in oral history, the oral history of the impact that this time made on people, which I think is really important for people to remember. Um, so, uh, the, the, the whole reason, it's sort of a long complicated story, but the whole reason that um, Sharon ended up at PS243, the Weeksville School, uh, uh, was through um, her mother's involvement with the Ocean Hill Brownsville month-long teacher strike in New York, um, which I won't go into. I mean, some of you might have heard or heard about it, studied about it, but basically it was challenging um, discriminatory educational practices and trying to um, <coughs> decentralize education, put more power in the hands of parents and teachers. And through a whole sort of, um, if you listen to Betty Welch's oral history, through a whole sort of turn of events, eventually she put Sharon in PS243, where she heard a presentation done by Jim Hurley. And that's how she got involved with Weeksville. Um, it was right up her alley in terms of education and teaching. Um, also, uh, as an interesting kind of side note, I was actually trying to get this for the, the presentation, but it was not working out. Um, the AFT, one of the largest teachers union in the country, supported the march on Washington and, and participated in the event, as many of you may know. It so happens that Betty Welch's, and this is after knowing her for so many years, we, you know, that's another thing, you do these repeated oral histories and you find out all this new information, like, why, why haven't you told us this? Um, <laughs> Betty Welch's uncle, we learned like last year, worked for the New York City Police Force and was the first black super chief of the NYPD. Before becoming super chief, he used to work security for Coretta Scott King. And as a result, he has this incredible color footage, the only color footage I've ever seen of the march in Washington, mm -hmm. from his own sort of video making, where he documents himself and his son, and his son is actually holding the camera while he's talking, and he's working security at the march, and you see all these other New York policemen wearing these fezes, and it's eye level of the march in Washington. Mm -hmm. So, you know, none of this is coincidental. All of this is part of the momentum that is, is um, making people want to defend the history of Weeksville and preserve the site for future generations. And this, I just had to include this for all the oral historians in the room. I just Love this. So um, you know, if you haven't done if you haven't done oral history work where you encounter people who are worried about saying the wrong thing and getting things wrong, you will eventually. <laughs> but um, it, one of the ways that plays out is that they're worried they don't know the dates of things and that they're wrong and they don't they're you're not an expert on their own history. So this is sort of an antidote to that because we discovered the last interview that we did of Betty Welch her home that she has saved every calendar of her life since the 1970s. And so she, I, you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts on approaching this as its own kind of oral history project. She was going through meetings she forgot that she went to. She can tell you the exact day that meetings happened, organizations she belonged to that she forgot just by her calendars. She has a, a huge box of them. And so, um, you know, for those of us who keep calendars, you don't always go to the things on your calendar. So I'd be interested in that as an oral history project in terms of how you look at that as a record. Um, but you know, we didn't we didn't take it too much on. But I just had to take the picture of her with all the calendars. Almira and Henrietta Corsi. Uh, Almira Corsi passed away also recently. This is her daughter Henrietta, who happens to be an educator outside of New York City. 
Um, Betty Welch worked closely with Amara. She was the assistant to the Vice Chancellor of Urban Affairs at New York Community City College. And um, according to Betty Welch, responsible for helping Jim Hurley to relocate what was then called the Project Weeksville to an educational institution, which was the New York City Community College's Pearl Building, located in downtown Brooklyn. Um, community members collaborated with New York City Community College to help catalog artifacts from the dig, investigate institutions of Weeksville, and collect oral history. Um, and exhibitions were also mounted to garner um, and attention and support for the project. Um, and what Betty Welch has said about Amaya Corsi is that without her help, there would be no Weeksville. Everything that happened in the black community in Brooklyn at that time, she was involved in and reported back to the vice chancellor. Um, and this image is, of, you know, a lot of movers and shakers, Alma Carroll in the, in the front, who's part of our Jazz Oral History Project, actually. But this image documents the renaming ceremony of an amphitheater after Elmira in Herbert Von Keith Park in Bed Stein 2011 to acknowledge her contributions to the development of the park and her lifelong dedication um, to community service. So again, lots of um, activism and lots of connections. This is just an image of the first major exhibit of the project's finding uh, mounted in New York City Community College Library in December 1969. This is William T. Harley, who was a lifelong resident of Bed-Stuy and also one of the co-founders and uh, the heads of the archaeological project. Um, the exhibit was extended through 1970 by popular demand. And I put this in here because another movement that's connected to Weeksville is college activism. Um, because just in 1969, a year later, you have college activism demanding um, black studies departments sweeping across the country. Um, so this is Sehu Louis Jeffy. He came to Weeksville through the college student activism in Brooklyn and New York. Um, he, he was uh, organizing to, uh, for, for more African American faculty, for black studies, um, and while he was attending New York City Community College. He says in an interview, we were involved in the late 60s developing relevant programs for students. One was the African American History Program and a women's program and a Latino history program there. We met with a lot of resistance, but we in essence took the hallways and really campaigned very hard for programs that were relevant to black folks. And it took us two years, but we got an African American history program. And he went on, while he was in college, to work with William T. Harley, who you saw, and Hurley on archiving and cataloging the, archae the archaeological objects found from the excavation. Um, he, it also so happens he was a big supporter of a black nationalist organization, I don't know if you've heard of, called uh, The East. And it's located in Bed-Stuy, and he used to put on all sorts of um, very famous music programs. Um, he says in, in his interview, I very much respected the independent black school as well as the National Black Theater. Um, I think he was also an actor. He said, where I in fact crafted the art of liberating myself. <laughs> so I, I think it's interesting that he's connecting all these different parts to liberation, even his work with Weeksville. Oh, these are the pictures of the East. <laughs> and the East had its own independent black school. <sighs> This is Jocelyn Cooper squared. This is Jocelyn Cooper Sr. and Josh, Jocelyn Cooper Jr. <laughs> um, Jocelyn Cooper Sr. is a community activist and her family is very important. They have made a huge impact in civil rights in black Brooklyn. Her late husband, Andrew Cooper, this is a recent book that just came out, um, who was a beer company employee, journalist, and political columnist, sued New York state officials in the landmark case, Cooper versus Power challenging the arrangement of congressional districts, charging that, quote, black citizens were denied the right to elect an authentic representative of their community. And winning the case, the court issued that the 12th district be redrawn, creating a new seat, which made it possible for Shirley Chisholm, part of Cooper's political club, to run for that seat and to become the first black woman of con member of Congress. And um, some of you might know, because this is a really important newspaper, um, Andrew Cooper was also the founder of something called the City Sun, S-U-N, the black-owned newspaper whose motto was Speaking Truth to Power, um, which represented a very strong political voice. And then uh, Jocelyn Cooper, so, so Jocelyn Cooper Sr. is a very good friend of Joan Maynard, 
very big supporter of Weeksville, and Jocelyn Cooper Jr., we, I don't want to even say coincidentally, because none of this is coincidental, <laughs> we work with um, very much in our programming, um, she's one of the geniuses behind Afropunk, and we do a lot of um, joint programming with them that day. So speaking of Shirley Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm, um, there she is, she was very involved also, uh, right there at the beginning with William T. Harley, Jim Hurley, um, with supporting Weeksville. Um, we have several lovely images of her um, with uh, William T. Harley. There's one of Joan Maynard and her presenting her with this lovely portrait. Okay, this is the final one, I promise. I'm going to. <laughs> um, this is Clarence Robertson. He grew up in Weeksville neighborhood and he attended local <coughs> schools and, and university. And he's also currently a member of the Weeksville Heritage Center Board of Directors. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, have this clip be the last clip because he has a very, he's a lovely person, um, uh, first of all, but he has a very interesting um, part of his interview where he's talking about what it means to be an activist and why he's involved in all the things that he's involved with. Um, and, I, and I think, again, that's one of the benefits of oral history to, to not just sort of get what you think happened or what you remember happened, but also what it means to you. I don't believe that you have a right to do nothing in life. I, I think that a person that does nothing is stealing air from others. You know, just no reason for you to breathe if you're just going to walk through life and never have an impact. Uh, I've been on the school board, Ocean Hill Brownsville. I've worked as executive over there. I worked as a school board member in right, right in this area, Crown Heights, District 17. I've been on the governor's staff, you carry as a program associate. I worked with the Brooklyn District Attorney uh, as a director of alternative sentencing, which is a whole other story. Mm -hmm. I've been the president of the Urban League in Brooklyn for a couple of years. My wife is very involved with her, with the uh, retired teachers and principals, because she was a super deputy superintendent. And so we have a myriad of organizations and activities that we participate in because we believe individually and collectively, but it's our responsibility. If you live here, you should be involved with it. I've run for all of this. I've done all kinds of stuff. You read me Shirley Chisholm, but she is out there. And it's all about taking responsibility for who you are and where you are. Uh, you know, he's a very humble person. I, this is one of the downsides of um, doing these sound bites and editing out of context because it sounds like he's bragging, but he doesn't. He's not that kind of person at all. So I feel like I have to qualify my, my editing choice there. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, I mean, this is this is this is just a glimpse of what we've been finding and. One of the questions I wanted to raise in doing all this is we've never done an all out, let's do an oral history initiative project on activism. And in some ways we haven't had to, but the fact that it keeps coming up, I'm wondering how much is gained or how much would be lost if we did do that. I mean, I know that you know, people are always calling and saying, oh, we're doing a, you know, a project on civil rights, we're doing a project, you know, does Weeks will have any, um, anything to contribute? And we're like, well, everything, you know, <laughs> because it comes up so often. So, I'm not sure that it, it, it would actually be beneficial because if you just focus on that, does that mean you lose the context of what, um, what caused people to be um, participants you know, in these struggles? So, you know, so far we haven't done anything, but that's just something I wanted to raise for discussion. Um, um, you know, so, so these are kind of the stories that have been I don't want to say filling the landscape because they've been there, but these these stories. But you know, we feel like um, they they they're allowing us to build relationships with people, rebuild relationships with people. Um, so far, so good. They've been working well from us, but for us um, to sustain you know these relationships. But just to show you some contemporary issues, contemporary images of Weeksville um, beyond the the, the story making tradition. You know, there's um, how the space is used. There's dance traditions. Um, this is the opening of Dance Africa through Brooklyn Academy of Music. Always um, 
is always at Weeksville is now um, open to the public. Um, we have music concerts. Um, we have, um, uh, this, is, this is our audience at one of our garden party series. We have a farmer's market. I mean, there's, there's the voices that are adding to the landscape. There's people that are adding to the landscapes with the traditions. Of, I don't think that stories and doing oral histories are the only way. I think they all sort of fill this landscape and, and um, help us to create community. So I just wanted to, to show the context. Of course, education and children are a big part of Weeksville. These are kids doing an eco-kite project. And this is Weeksville in the near future <laughs> um, with this 19,000 square foot building. We talked about it a little bit before. There will be everything that we do at Weeksville in terms of programming will be expanded. So we have two education classrooms. We have a contemporary art gallery. We have a performing art space. We have a sound studio that may double as an oral history studio. Um, and everything, we have a media lab, um, oh, we have a resource center that hopefully these these materials will be made available. Um, but you know, we can talk more about what we, we plan to do with the oral history work. Um, but basically, everything, like I said earlier, everything that we do, we're trying to encourage participation and democratization of this history, and just to make sure that what happened before doesn't happen again. That if people want to preserve a history, that they're able to do that um, on their own terms. So self determination is a big. And I think oh yeah, this, this is one of our construction shots of the, the real site. The other one was a sketch. So. Um, but we're much further along with this. They're just sort of landscaping now. So everyone should come out and visit the center and take tours. That's it. Thank you.